On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Um, today we're actually starting a new series uh, through some interactions in the Gospel of John, one of the, one of the New Testament books of the Bible. Um, and the series is called Encountering Jesus. And really that's what my hope is and prayer is for us as a church, is that as we give ourselves you know, a bit of energy to, to looking into some of these uh, interactions that Jesus had with various types of people, all different types, um, that, that not, not only will we learn about Jesus, but we will actually, for ourselves, encounter him. Um, that's what we believe. That's, that's what uh, the Bible teaches us, that when we read and when we get to know the person who's at the center of the story, Jesus, uh, we're not just learning about a historic figure like you might learn in the history books at school, but we're reading someone who's alive and who's present and who works and changes and interacts with, with us. And so that's all about encountering Jesus. Um, so we're going to uh, spend some time this morning looking at this uh, text that, that Jeff has just read expertly for us this morning from John chapter 2. Maybe you have heard this story before. Um, if you haven't, that's okay. We're going to take our time to try and understand what's going on and get, get the gist. And then we're going to be thinking about how does that actually then help us um, to encounter Jesus here this morning. And uh, I, want to, I want to equip you. I want to help you build some blocks of understanding and knowledge. But I also want to let you know that you, you might actually encounter Jesus afresh this morning um, as we are learning. So please, don't think this is something to store up for the future. Um, actually, the Lord Jesus himself uh, may have something for you this morning. We believe, as, as his word is, 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 is open, that that's what happens. So listen out. Uh, be aware of that. Anyway, um, this is a famous sort of account, I suppose, the old water into wine story you may have heard of before. You maybe even heard people using that phrase or do you think I can turn water into wine? You know, uh, you might say or you might hear people say. Um, but actually, according to this verse, uh, these verses that we've just read together, um, this, is, this was the first miracle that Jesus did. Well, certainly according to John's um, gospel presentation, the Apostle John. Um, and it's just so interesting, I think, because Jesus um, was at a wedding party when he chose to, to do his first miracle. Um, he, he, he didn't do a healing. He does those later. Um, he didn't go and help the poor. He does that as well. But his first miracle happened in the moment of a celebration. Um, and so let's have a look at the, the scenario here. It says in, in, in verse uh, 1 of our section today, uh, on the third day, that's the third day after Jesus sort of launched effectively his public ministry as he was baptized by John the Baptist and, and, and Jesus sort of started his teaching ministry. Um, so, th you know, third day later or three days later, um, here he is at a wedding party, a wedding celebration. And the scenario is that, that uh, Jesus was there with some of his disciples some of his own pals, and uh, it says in verse 3, the wine ran out. And that's, that's our scenario, that's our problem. And this is more than just a bit annoying or a bit disappointing, um, as you could probably imagine. 
uh, particularly in, in, in ancient Near East culture that we're looking at here. You know, this is obviously far removed from our own culture. Uh, it was considered to be greatly shameful if, uh, if you, the host, uh, ran out of drink um, and ran out of, uh, you know, all, all the bits and pieces that you need for a great celebration. If you ran out of those things, it's considered to be a, a huge embarrassment. I think it would be uh, mildly embarrassing for us, but, but, but far more so in those, in those days. See, it was the job of the bridegroom, that is the, the man getting married and his family, it was their job to provide a great time, a great celebration for all those who were gathered. Um, there's actually some, some stories uh, from, from uh, th- those days of, of uh, legal action being taken by the bride's family against the groom's family for, for, for failing to come up with the goods. So this is pretty serious stuff here. And uh, what we see uh, is Jesus' mother, who we know is Mary. It doesn't actually call her name there, but Mary. And uh, she's really concerned about this situation. She's concerned for the, the plight. We presume that um, either it was a family member or a relative or just a close friend of Mary's um, that was getting married, and so therefore Jesus and the team were also uh, part of that invitation. Anyway, uh, she says to Jesus, when when it occurs that they've no wine, uh, she goes to him and just says, simply, they've no wine. She went to Jesus for help. Um, And and this this is most likely what they've been doing uh, in the family, for, for many years, uh, Jesus at this stage uh, was the main breadwinner of the family. Um, we think most likely that, the, that, that Joseph, his earthly father, had died. He was no longer on the scene. Um, and so Jesus uh, took on the family business as a young man growing up. He, he learned the trade of, of, of a carpenter. And, and so his role as, as, as the son, as the oldest son of the family, there were others that came after him, um, to Joseph and Mary, uh, but his role was to be the, the breadwinner. He was the, the leader of the household, I suppose, in, in those days. And so it's natural that Mary would turn to him and say, look, can you do something here? Can you come up with the goods? And so Jesus' response is sort of odd, I suppose, in verse 4. Jesus says to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? Um, it sounds a bit, a bit, um, a bit rude, doesn't it, to, to call your mum that, and uh, a bit, a bit, um, a bit sharp and short. But I, I, I'm led to believe that in the original language, um, particularly Aramaic, which is a form of Hebrew, uh, that Jesus and his uh, his uh, culture would have spoken, um, uh, that that did not come across as a, as a rude thing to say. Just more like. Um, I suppose mother dear or something like that. I don't know uh, how you would refer to your mum, but something, you know, just a term of endearment. What, what, what does that have to do with me? In other words, what he's saying is, what, what do you want me to do? Um, my way and your way are, are quite different. Um, what do we have in common? That, that's kind of the, 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 the things that are being uh, summed up with this woman. What does this have to do with me that Jesus says? Effectively, Jesus is saying, look, we've got, we've got different agendas here. Uh, we're, we're singing from different hymn sheets. Because he goes on to say, my hour has not yet come. You know, my, my time is not here yet. This is not it. This is not the time when I you know, really want to launch. But anyway, uh, Mary knows uh, something that most others don't, that he's a special, he's special. And uh, it says in verse 5, his mother says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And so we're told in the story here in verse 6, um, there are six stone water jars um, sitting around, probably mostly empty, for, uh, it says there, for purification, the Jewish rites of purification. Um, each, each holding about 20 or 30 gallons. I have no idea how big a gallon is, so I had to look it up and do a translation on, on Google. But apparently it's about 80 to 120 liters. So if you think of a big kitchen bin, you know, if you're buying the kitchen bin bags, you, you're looking for the ones of 80 liters. That's roughly, you know, something that maybe would come up to here. And, and, um, and Jesus says to them, uh, to the servants, fill the, these jars, the six of them, fill them with water, and they fill them up to the brim. And then he instructs them in verse 8, now draw some water out and take it to the master of the feast. And they did. The master of the feast is, is uh, I suppose, the head, head waiter. You know, if you're getting married in a hotel or something like that. And it's often the person who sort of, you know, wears the suit and um, just makes sure everything's working well and the bride and the groom are happy and everything. Um, that, that's, that's who this person is here in verse, verse 8. Take it to, to the head waiter, the master of the ceremony, who then tasted the wine, it says there, and... Um, it was amazing. 
The master of, this is verse 9. The master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, um, and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. When people have drunk freely, you bring out the rubbish stuff. They, they, they won't know any better. But you've kept the good wine till now. This is amazing stuff. Delicious. Where, where, where have you got this from? I, I don't know a huge amount about wine myself. Um, I'd like to think that I could possibly tell the difference between a five-pound bottle and a 500-pound bottle, but I'm not sure. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't uh, back myself there. Possibly when it comes to coffee. I'm more of a coffee drinker, um, and so um, I probably would be able to tell you, oh, that's expensive and that's cheap rubbish. Um, occasionally, you, you, you buy something, you drink something that is just like nothing else you've ever tried before. Just out of this world. You're like, my goodness me, this is so unusual. This is so good. This is so different to the stuff I usually drink. Just hits the spot. Right? It just clicks. You're just like, oh, this, this, is, this is it. I think something like that would have gone on with the master of ceremonies who sipped this stuff. And he says, you save the best till last. Most people save the rub, yeah, use, the, use up the good stuff first and then use the rubbish later. But little did he know that this is all because of Jesus, what Jesus has, has done. It seems to be that the wine that Jesus provided was even better than the good stuff the bridegroom had already drunk through. And it says there at the end of our text, his disciples believed in him. So that's just, a, I suppose, an overview then of what, what the story is, just so we can get to grips with what's being said to us. But secondly, we're going to look then at the, the, I suppose, the theology of the whole thing, which I admit is not a very exciting title. Um, but hopefully as we go, we can figure out um, why this is really important for us to know about. And, and we, can, we can read the account, can't we, as we've just done, and we can think, well, okay, this is great, um, really interesting, Jesus has done a nice thing, He's, he wants people to, to, to enjoy the celebrations, that's, that's great. Um, but what I want to do in this section is to try and show you that there is actually a lot more going on than, than just pro providing a good time and doing a nice magic trick. Because you see, in order for us to encounter Jesus, for you to encounter Jesus, um, it's important to see what's really going on under the, under the surface here. Um, because what we've just seen and examined is not just any old sign. All right? It's not just Jesus warming up. You know, I'll do the water into wine thing first, and then you know, tomorrow I'll, I'll, I'll heal the, the paralyzed man, and then in a few weeks' time, maybe move on to, to raising Lazarus from the dead. This is not Jesus just get, getting into it, um, as if any magic trick would have done. You know, as, as if he could have said to the donkey that was sort of tied up over there uh, and turned it into a unicorn. You know? or, or, or Jesus could have suddenly sprouted wings and, and, and flown around a bit. There's something really important about the water into wine. And I hope to show you in the next few moments what, what that is. If we can understand that, then we're well on our way to, to understanding and encountering Jesus on his own terms. Um, the, the whole water into wine thing is, is, is laden with, with, with symbolism. Um, there's, there's a deeper meaning, and I think that helps us to unlock this whole thing here. It will help us to encounter Jesus. Um, let, let, let's, let's go back a little bit. What are these stone water jars for? Um, Verse 6, six stone water jars there for Jewish rites of purification. Uh, in other words, what was in there, which is now empty, had been used up because the wedding guests had all used it, was, was water for ceremonial washing. Um, and the, the idea was, particularly according to Jewish tradition, um, you would wash yourself before eating. You would not only wash yourself, but you'd, you'd, if you're really very religious, you would wash your cups and your plates and your utensils. Um, you would do all that. Uh, not that necessarily everybody at the, the wedding was very religious, but you often find, don't you, that, that at wedding times, people are a bit more religious than normal uh, and at other, other moments in their lives. They tend to be a bit more religious, maybe at a funeral or, or what have you. But so, so, so there they are, and everyone was, was using this. And the idea is um, that, that you cleanse yourself so that you're not, bringing sort of contamination onto the food. I'm not talking about health and safety stuff here, but what I am talking about is, is, is the Jewish understanding of remaining clean, of being separate. Because when you're clean, you are clean in the eyes of God. 
uh, if you're dirty morally and sort of ceremonially, then you are unclean in God's sight. And, and, and only the clean people get to be in God's presence, get to enjoy him. So that was the idea. So they would, they would wash everything, including the food and everything they would use to eat it with, these religious actions, trying to remain ceremonially clean and therefore acceptable to God. And that's what these large water stone jars were, were for. Um, and I think, I think what they represent is, is this attempt, if you like, to make themselves clean, to make yourself clean. Um, attempt to, to removing the dirt removing the impurities so that they could stand right before God and enjoy his favor, enjoy his presence. That was the point of all that. And I think we can understand that as, as, as how people understood religion before Jesus came on the scene. This was the old way of, of doing things. They didn't know any better. But it was taking the water and turning it into wine. And that's the real difference. Water is water, wine is wine. They are, they are different, they have different properties, different order, different mentality. Water is used for trying to make yourself clean. Wine is used for celebration, for, for pleasure, for enjoyment, not for cleansing. No one has a, unless they're very odd, no one has a bath of wine. You'd come out stinking and sticky. Wine is for celebration. It points to blessing. It points to the, the favor of God on his people. It, it, it's, it's considered, it was considered by, by people at that wedding party and, 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 and the people of the Jews as, as, as an ingredient of the good life, the blessed life, that the God uh, is blessing his people. When the wine is flowing, God's blessing is flowing. This stemmed from the time when they didn't have any of this, that they were uh, slaves in Egypt, their, their four forefathers many many generations ago as slaves in Egypt they had nothing they went through the wilderness and God was saying one day I'm going to plant you into the promised land and that will be a place where you will plant vineyards and you will drink wine and enjoy my favor when the wine is flowing God's blessing is flowing the um, ancient Hebrew prophets Many, many years before Jesus came on the scene, they, they knew the importance of wine, the symbolism of wine. They, they spoke at a time, the, the ancient prophets spoke at a time when the people of Israel were, were beleaguered, they were oppressed by enemies, they were stuck, they were wandering, they were disobedient. They, but, in short, they spoke at a time when people were far from God. And they, they envisaged, the Hebrew prophets envisaged this, this time, this, this future new age, a, a new way of doing things. Because the old way of doing things, you, you, you've, you've messed up. You, 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 you can't get yourself clean. You can't get yourself right. It hasn't, hasn't worked. They, they pointed forward to a time, a, a coming time, of blessing and of celebration and joy and, and satisfaction in God. When his favor would come upon his people in, in, in fresh and unprecedented ways, in, in ways that were so deep and so profound, it was, as it were, they couldn't remove themselves from it. So profound was this new age of blessing that God was bringing. And the prophets were talking about it. They were calling to attention for that. And the Bible calls that thing, that new realm, that new age, it calls that the kingdom of God. This new experience of living in, in this new age brought about by God's Messiah. So you can see wine is a sign of, of the age to come, of the new age. Let's look at uh, one such of these Old Testament prophets, Isaiah 25. Some of the words are going to come up on the screen, just as a, a, as a rough indication as to what I'm talking about. Hopefully this will unlock something for you. Let me read to you the verse beforehand. Um, it's talking about God, and it says, God, you have been um, a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in times of distress, a shelter in the storm, and a shade from the heat. Who doesn't need that? He goes on to say, on this mountain, which is the, the, the place, the special presence of God, 
On this mountain, the Lord of hosts, that's God, will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine. Of rich food, full of marrow, of aged wine, well refined. Goes on to say, on that place, in that time, he, that is God, will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. Goes on to say, the shame and the guilt of his people, he will take away. This glimpse, this description of this new age to come. Do you notice the the use of wine as a sign of that age to come? The blessing of God. A place where the poor, the needy, those in distress can find God as a shelter, as a stronghold. God, as it were, provides a rich banquet for them to come to. A place, as it says there, where death is swallowed up and all the tears are wiped from their faces. And so when Jesus arrives on the scene at this particular wedding party and he turns water into wine, he's saying through symbols that that age has arrived. That moment is here. Symbolically, he's showing that the old way is passing away. The new way is here. This new life is upon you. It's among you. In turning water into wine and and, and aiding celebration, Jesus is saying, now is the time that God's blessing and his favor is being poured out upon you. It is coming. It is coming lavishly. So we can see, uh, this is more than just a simple miracle. As amazing as it is, it's pointing to something greater. A deeper reality. That's why it's called a sign at the end of our text in verse 11. It's a sign, the first of his signs. So the question is, I suppose then, if, if, if Jesus um, announces this amazing blessed life is here, if it is open to us and to, to people listening, as it were, over the shoulders of the disciples, then the question is, how do, we, how do we get that? How do we, how do we enter into that place that he's offering? Well, in verse 11, it says that this was the first of his signs where he manifested his glory. The point is that there are more to come. Um, and, and, and that's what we'll be examining as we go through this series, Encountering Jesus. These, these signs, these moments when Jesus um, interacts with people with all sorts of backgrounds and all sorts of questions, whether they're religious, uh, whether they're not religious, whether they are rich, whether they're poor, all sorts of different types of people um, will come to him and have these interactions with him. But the fact that this is called a sign... Uh, shows that it's pointing to something, something even greater. And as we go through John, you'll see this bit by bit over over the next few weeks as we're looking through the Gospel of John, all these signs are pointing towards one thing. They're all pointing in the same direction. They're all pointing to Jesus' greatest act, his greatest work, his journey to the cross. Uh, Towards the end of um, John's Gospel, as with all the four gospel accounts in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's a picture of Jesus at at another banquet, a different celebration, except it's not a wedding this time, it's it's the Jewish Passover, celebrating a feast with his friends, and wine was on the table, as it would be, um, for the Passover. And the wine gets passed around, sort of probably drinking from uh, sort of ceremonial cups, rehearsing a sort of a liturgy, the story of, of, of God's freedom of the people of Israel. And when the wine came to Jesus, he took the cup of wine, the wine of celebration, the wine of favor, and he said to his disciples, this is my blood, which is, which is poured out for you. 
He's saying, my life for yours. My blood for your life. I'm going to give myself, in a few moments after we finish this meal, I'm going to go and give myself to you. That's what he said to them. The cross was, was Jesus' greatest sign. And they took him, of course, as you know, the story, and nailed him to the cross, and, and there he died. This is how the new age comes to us. This is how we can enter the blessed life that Isaiah is describing, that is open for all. We enter by the cross of Jesus. And when Jesus rose again on the third day to everlasting life, that life that he has, he shares with all he would come to him to receive it. And so that's how we enter the blessed life that Isaiah saw in a glimpse and that Jesus uh, showed through the water into wine and later on through the, the, the blood that was poured out for you. That's how we enter the blessed life, the new age of God's favor, by, by coming to Jesus and believing in him. Receiving and resting. That's all we do. It's amazing. So we thought about the overview, I suppose, of the story. We thought about the, the theology of the story, about what's, what's going on with the, the wine and the, the sign of God's blessing and, and how that comes to us through Jesus giving his life for us. I want to... I come to the, the third and final section then as, we, as we're looking at this encounter. And we're going to ask, um, how does this help us to encounter Jesus? If we know these things, how, how does this apply to us? Um, how do we encounter the Jesus who is really there and not just some idea or some historic figure? Well, the, the Bible is clear um, that the offer that Jesus gives um, is still there. It's never been revoked, um, didn't, didn't pass away with the apostles or anything like that. The, the, the kingdom, the door to the kingdom is still open, as it were. You, you, right now, today, you can go from the old order of things to the new ways. You, you, you can sometimes come to church, and we've all been there. You, you can come to church sometimes and find that you are um, stuck in the old order, the old ways. Um, trying to make yourself acceptable, trying to make yourself right or good or improved or, or whatever language you want to put on, on it. We're, we're all at it. But you're stuck. And, 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 and you've been trying to live the good life, I suppose, by either following religious traditions, that's how some people do it, or, or other behaviors, non-religious behaviors or whatever, that you think will somehow earn you the good life or, or that, that is the good life itself even just practices or activities or hobbies, or whatever, in life that you think will bring you the peace and the satisfaction and the joy. But they, they, they don't seem to cut it. Um, maybe there's, there's a short-term benefit, a short-term joy and, and, and pleasure, but, but they, they, they never deliver. They always sort of fizzle out. Um, no, nothing really long-term, and so we go from one thing to another. You may have try, tried multiple options in order to try and experience something of this sense of peace or release, but they've all failed you in one way or another. And you've just been left empty and disappointed and cynical and burned out. I'm not just talking about religious people here. I'm talking about non-religious people. We, we do it in different ways, using different language, but we all do it. You might be here this morning and, and you might feel like you're stuck in that old way, that old order. As I say, whether you're from a church background or not at all. And you come this morning and you just feel empty and, and, and tired and, and lost. Well, Jesus, through the symbolism and through his word, is saying clearly to us this morning, aside from me, Nothing's going to satisfy you. Moreover, Jesus is saying, nothing has the power to deliver you. Nothing has the ability to match the joy and the satisfaction and the peace of the new age unless you come and get it from me.
You might relate this morning to those stone pots in verse 6. Empty, used up, standing around. But here's the offer to you this morning. If you would come to Jesus, he will fill you with new wine. He will replace the old ways that you have tried unsuccessfully to use, the failed attempts. He will remove your sins. He will remove your shame. He will deal with your regrets when you come to him. Instead, you will be filled with laughter in place of tears. Joy, celebration, you will be, as it were, invited to the Thanksgiving party. And just to be clear, this is what we're talking about is not just a, a basic improvement to your life as it currently stands. We are talking about a whole new life. You know, a fundamental shift in who you are. Wine is completely different to water. It looks different, it tastes different, it behaves differently. And so too will you, when you come out of that old order, the old ways, and are filled with the new wine that Jesus offers. So how do you make this yours? Let's nail it down. How do you make this yours? Well, in the story, in the account, rather, um, there, there are two groups of people um, who, who witness what's going on. Think about it. There's the disciples of Jesus on the one hand, and then there's the servants, the waiters, whatever, on the other hand. Both of these groups of people knew what Jesus had just done. They had the facts, right? The servants, like the disciples, they saw the miracle. They realized there was just water they put in, and when they dipped it out and brought it out, it was this exquisite wine. But as far as, they, as we can tell, that, that, was, that was it for the servants. They knew it was a miracle. They were probably amazed on one level, but they remained unchanged. They just saw the sign, but they didn't see the one it was pointing to. You know, if you go along the West Link, for example, and you see a road sign pointing to Dublin, you don't just think to yourself as you, as you look at it, wow, I'm in Dublin. You, you know you're not. It, it's, pointing, it's pointing you in the right direction. We all know that. But the servants just looked at the sign and they thought that was it. They didn't follow it through. They didn't go to the, where it was pointing. Some of you will react like that. But the other group are the disciples, the second group. They, they saw what Jesus had done, water into wine, but it says in verse 11, his disciples believed in him. And therein lies the difference. It is a huge difference. They knew the water in the, into wine wasn't just a clever trick from some sort of anointed magician or, or, or clever teacher because they knew that it pointed to Jesus. It was just a sign. They, 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 they looked at that and they realized that that was Jesus opening the door to them. And that is how you make this yours too. When you see what Jesus did to open the door for you by going to the cross and, 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 and allowing his blood to be spilt and saying, this is my blood for you. When you realize that he died for you and he literally shed his blood for you, that is the moment that you enter the kingdom of God. You take your place, as it were, at the banqueting table. You draw up a seat and you join the celebration. And when you see Jesus in that light, when you realize 
that because of his love for you, that's what he did, your emptiness will start to become filled up. Your yearning for that which only truly satisfies will be satisfied. Because you see, unlike the bridegroom in this story, Jesus is the true bridegroom whose wine never runs out, never dries up. It is plentiful, it is abundant, it is overflowing. And that is good news for you and I when we think that he hasn't got enough blessing left for us or because I've been so bad in the past, maybe just a few drops is all I can humbly expect. No, no, no. His wine never dries up. It is constant. And it will overflow until you have more than you know what to do with. And that is his promise to you this morning. Perhaps, um, as we close out, perhaps you're a believer already. Um, So let me encourage you as, as we're going through these things. If you are a believer already in Jesus, may what we're discussing this morning stoke your faith. May it it grow your hope. Because as a believer in Jesus, you you have to see this. You have undergone a seismic shift. You're no no longer of the old order of things, but you are now a member of the new order, the kingdom of God. You may not always feel like it if you are a believer in Jesus, but you can expect and anticipate this evidence in your own life of the new age, this substantial and real change is not only possible, it is expected. And so as a believer, in a few moments, as we, as we respond, as we uh, come to worship again, and as, as you may come to the, to the back to the, to the table and take the bread as a believer in Jesus and drink the wine, you can do that on the basis of this, knowing that you are coming to a celebration. As you drink that wine or juice, you're, you're, you're reminding yourself and being refreshed in the favor of God. The wine is there for celebration. The body of Christ shown in the, in the bread and the blood of Christ through the, the wine is a celebration. It is life to you. And so as you take the bread and the wine in a few moments, as you eat and drink, it is a sign of the new age. It is a sign of the coming kingdom. And as you eat and drink, you can anticipate that beautiful banquet to come. We celebrate that all God has done for us through his son. Amen. Let's pray.